Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Today's episode is with one of my favorite authors, Steve Cole. Steve previously wrote Ghost Wars and Directorid S. Ghost Wars was the story of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and the United States from the 1980s up until September 11th. And Directorid S focused on the post-9-11 story covering the Pakistani intelligence services relationship to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. This conversation, though, is focused on the Iraq war. Steve has a new book out. It's called The Achilles Trap, Saddam Hussein, the CIA, and the Origin of America's Invasion of Iraq. This book is interesting because he isn't just retreading the Iraq war story, its origins and aftermath. We've covered a lot on the show. He's focused instead on the relationship between the United States, the CIA, and Saddam, and the miscalculations and misinterpretations that happened along the course of their 30-year-plus relationship. As the United States thinks of its relationship towards authoritarian rulers like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, uh, obviously Russia and China respectively, we need to think about how our previous dealings with a previous dictator in the 20th century failed to lead to understanding and proper courses of action. As we're thinking about this theme of generational change in American politics, I'm particularly obsessed with the idea that one of the number one tasks facing millennials, Gen Xers, or Gen Zs um, is the need to avoid anything that remotely looks like the Iraq war. So understanding the lead up to there and the relationship side of it is just really key. So hope you all enjoy this conversation and let me know what you think in the comments or drop us a note at our email. You can find those both in the show notes. Huge thank you to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. Steve Cole, welcome to The Realignment. Uh, thanks for having me, Marshall. Glad to be here. Yeah, great to chat with you with the launch of your new book. So before we get into the book itself, I was thinking through the question I wanted to start with. And I think the first question I'd ask you is, do you believe the invasion of Iraq was the most defining moment of the 21st century versus 11 2008 financial crisis, invasion of Ukraine, COVID. I kind of lean towards it being the defining moment, <laughs> but I'm curious what you would think about that answer. Well, that you you made it hard by listing those other contenders because uh, those are pretty good finalists. Um, I would say, um, let's throw COVID out, uh, kind of a different category, and maybe we have bounced through it uh, other than the many tens of thousands of families who uh, didn't. Um, but this was a man-made error, um, the invasion of Iraq. And I think what I would say for sure is that it's the most consequential foreign policy mistake the United States has made in the post-Cold War era. Um, and it has had cascading consequences for the 20 years since uh, it was launched. And I think it also... Um, had an impact on America um, in ways that we haven't fully mapped yet, because you know we have had a volunteer army since the 1970s, volunteer military since the 1970s, and the volunteers who uh, went to Iraq, um, you know, aren't as familiar to the coastal elites as they are to the communities where they um, grew up and where they return bitter. Um, in many cases, because of the mistakes that their leaders have made, whether it was their national leadership for putting them into an impossible situation in the first place, or you know their generals and colonels who um, you know kept telling them that success was just around the corner as they watched their comrades, uh, you know, take you know these devastating hits. I think one thing that we don't appreciate all. Um, as as much as soldiers do is that battlefield medicine has increased survival rates from traumatic strikes when you're in a fight uh, incredibly over the last 20 years but what it means is a lot of people survive and come home with terrible terrible wounds that would have killed them in other wars so we know about the lost limbs but also traumatic brain injury and other other sources of enduring suffering and i think that has made a lot of people angry in ways that, as I say, isn't fully mapped. So yeah, it, it's a it's a huge event um, in not just our relationship with the world, but our own um, story at home. 
Yeah, I just appreciate your point about how in many ways we probably haven't truly unpacked the feelings or also the chain of events that emerge. I mean, think of um, President Obama beat Hillary Clinton in the primary. Um, a large reason behind that decision is the fact he did he opposed the Iraq war in contrast um, to her vote in the Senate. But to get to the actual book then, as you put it, it's been 20 years um, since the invasion, 20 plus years since the invasion. So what more was there to be said about the origins of the war itself? Like, what are you adding to the research discussion and actually the challenge presented by the war by writing this book? Well, I hope quite a, quite a lot for the great majority of um, readers because essentially our story of the origins of the war has understandably been focused on the decisions of the George W. Bush administration made between 9-11 and the invasion of March 2003. And we all remember, you know, the um, misinformation about Iraq's WMD that was used to sell the war to the American public. We know about the media's complicity in not scrutinizing the intelligence and the evidence about it as carefully as they might have. And um, these political consequences, you know, have been an important part, as you say, right up until um, the 2008 election and beyond. But I think to understand the origins of the war, you have to, of any war, you have to um, include all of the antagonists and combatants. And so what I set out to do was to tell the origins of the, to enlarge our understanding of the origins of the war, um, largely by documenting Saddam's side of the story. And by that, I mean, you know, we all ask, um, why did America invade Iraq on the basis of a WMD threat that didn't exist? But you could flip the question around and ask, you know, why did Saddam Hussein create the impression that he had WMD when he didn't? Uh, and it wasn't just the Americans who thought he had it. You know, the UN thought he had it. The inspectors thought he had it. Even the Germans who opposed the war thought he had it. So how did this misimpression arise? What was he thinking? And ultimately, he sacrificed his reign and power, his regime, his life, his son's lives, ultimately. Um, so, so how did that happen on his side? Well, it's a question I've been I've been interested in since I was, uh, you know, I, I went to the, as a Washington Post reporter, I covered the ceasefire ceremony in Safwan, Iraq at the end of the Kuwait war. And I've been thinking about Saddam um, ever since. And it turns out that the question, this is where the book came from. It turns out the question is answerable because Saddam tape recorded his leadership conversations more assiduously than Richard Nixon, the thousands of hours of, of tapes of him talking to his comrades at decisive moments of his long conflict with the United States. And not only does it unpack how the war really originated in full, it's also a kind of case study of the inner mind of a dictator who, you know, generally we don't understand exactly what they're thinking and saying at moments where they disrupt the world. And here we have this incredible record. Um, now, it's not available to the public generally. Um, it Parts of it were released and then withdrawn by the United States government. Um, but I worked with uh, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and filed a FOIA suit against the Pentagon and got a big batch of the materials, collected other materials from elsewhere, interviewed survivors, and um, yeah, it was a fascinating project, but I think it was really those tapes and the inner records of the regime that drew me to attempting to kind of retell and enlarge the story of where this war came from. So, so many follow-up questions here. So number one, I think if we were to build another list of realities that maybe the public is not aware of when it comes to the Iraq war, the idea that Saddam really did create the impression of the existence of a nuclear pro or a WMD program, probably near the top of that list, that this wasn't just something that was cooked up in DC for good or for ill. There really was this impression. So can you like articulate for folks, what had Saddam specifically done from the 1990s onward to give that perception? 
Right. Okay. Great question. So we have to go back to the the first Gulf War, as we call it, when Saddam invaded Kuwait in 1990. Um, And then George H.W. Bush's government led an international coalition to expel Iraqi forces from Kuwait, but famously decided not to go on and knock Saddam out of power, but left him in power. But it was at the moment of uh, inflection in post-war history because the Cold War had just ended. Essentially, the Berlin Wall had just fallen. The Soviet Union was cracking up. And even uh, Soviet uh, leader Mikhail Gorbachev was cooperating with Bush in the war, uh, by and large. So after Saddam was expelled from Kuwait, the UN Security Council uh, unanimously, so including the Soviets and the Chinese um, who had a veto they could have used, they decided to tell Saddam, you have to give up all of your dangerous weapons because he had used chemical weapons in plain sight throughout the 1980s. During his war with Iran, he had gassed the hell out of Iranian troops and he had used gas against his own rebellious Kurdish population uh, infamously at Halabja and other places. So everybody knew he had the stuff. He had deployed it to use it against the American-led invasion. The last minute, he decided not to do it. I think he was deterred from doing it by some messages the Americans sent. I think he believed that we would nuke him if he used chemical weapons. So anyway, he didn't use them, but he was ordered by the UN to disarm all, all of the WMD and any missile that could carry the WMD you know, beyond a certain distance. So he was allowed to keep his tanks and his soldiers and his rifles, but he had to give up chemical, biological, nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. And that was a, you know, a Security Council resolution. So the UN then appointed an inspection team to go into Iraq and look for the stuff and make sure that it was all destroyed. They had the full backing of the UN system. Like if you come across some chemical weapons, just set them on fire and take out a clipboard, take some photographs so we know what happened. But that that was the mission. And so they, they went in and they started looking. Okay, so here's what we didn't know at the time. This was the summer of 1991. So Saddam, he decided these, these sanctions uh, and this disarmament requirement was coming at him. It was going to cripple his economy. He wanted to get out of his box as fast as he could. So he wanted to pass the inspections, but he didn't want to and humiliate pause, himself. When yeah, you sure. say out of his box, what do you mean by that? The sanctions that were imposed alongside this disarmament requirement essentially linked crippling economic sanctions to his performance in disarmament. In other words, until you show us that you've gotten rid of these things that we say you can't have anymore, you're going to be subject to crippling economic sanctions. So no imports, no exports, your oil is going to be bottled up. Iraq has a lot of oil, you can't sell it, and so on. And he could feel the pinch already. He, He just lost a war, so he was already kind of bombed and trying to rebuild and so forth. So in the summer of 1991, we now know, he decided that the best way to pass inspections would be to actually destroy all the stuff he had, but not tell anybody about it because he was unwilling to humiliate himself in front of his own people or the Arab world where he sought glory by basically allowing these white-coated inspectors to stand there and destroy everything that he had and that he had built up and that was a source of his strength. And I think he believed that you can see in his conversations with comrades uh, that he says different things at different times. Essentially, he believed that this would make him vulnerable. It would make him vulnerable to his own generals who would say, ah, you know, you, you, you've you gotten rid of your special weapons. You've humili- humiliated Iraq in front of the war by, uh, in front of the world by losing this war. He also feared that it would make him vulnerable to uh, his enemies abroad principally Iran and Israel. And he was afraid that they would attack him if they thought they could get away with it. So he he wanted it both ways. He figured if there was nothing to find and the inspectors came in and looked for it, they didn't find anything, then he would pass the inspections more quickly or he was testing the idea. He didn't really believe the UN would ever let him off the hook, but he wanted to pass the inspections. So anyway, he destroyed the stuff. He didn't want to get caught with it. But he didn't tell anybody about it. And, and, and a quick keep... question, what is the stuff to be? It's like, what, okay. what specifically did he have? <laughs> well, he had a large arsenal of 
finished chemical weapons. So um, uh, mustard gas, sarin primarily, some of it was weaponized in shells. He had used these kinds of shells during the Iran war, artillery shells, sometimes like gravity bombs you could drop out of a plane. Um, he also had early, he had biological weapons that were potent. He had never really used them in a battle. So it turns out that it can be hard to successfully use biological weapons because they burn up real fast if there's an mm -hmm. explosion. But um, he had them and he also had the infrastructure to build them. So, you know, it wasn't just that you had to get rid of your artillery shells if you were Saddam. You had to, you were supposed to get declare and get rid of all the factories and the precursor materials and everything involved in that weapons system. And in the case of nuclear weapons, he had been secretly trying to build a bomb since about 1981. He had made some progress that the world didn't know about it, um, that the world didn't know about. And he had some um, enriched uranium that he had made, that his scientists had made themselves. And he also had some nuclear reactors that the world knew about, but he had basically stolen the potential, potential nuclear weapons material out of the reactors during the Kuwait war and hidden it, figuring that maybe in desperation, he could build a bomb with it. He had also done some work on, on an actual weapon, which is a hard part of making a, a nuclear bomb. So he had all this stuff and he basically destroyed it all. In a summer, he had his son-in-law do it. His son-in-law, who was like his main kind of henchman at the time, um, and very energetic, Hussein Kamal. And he went out and supervised. Uh, they literally poured the weapons into the sand in the desert, and they didn't take any photographs of it. They didn't inventory like how much there had been and how much they had destroyed. They had some records from the past, but. Um, so what happened was the inspectors came in, and I'll wrap this up and we can move on, but the inspectors came in in 1991 looking for this stuff as they were ordered to do by the UN, and they couldn't find anything. But not only had he destroyed it and not told anyone, he then started lying about the history of the programs. So they would say, hmm, this looks like a milk factory that isn't a milk factory. This looks like it was part of a biological weapons program. Our specialists say the kinds of things, equipment you've imported and the residues we see here, that's a biological weapons. And he would say he destroyed all of the materials, but then he would say, no, no, it's, it's just a milk factory. you know. And, and so they would catch him in these lies and they would say, okay, you're lying. Um, so therefore you're covering up the fact that you actually have this stuff. And that cat and mouse game went on for 10 years and it never really changed character. Uh, at, toward the end of it, Saddam just gave up on the whole process. He said, I'm never going to get sanctions relief. It doesn't matter if I confess, um, I'm never going to get relief. They want me gone and I'm not going anywhere. The other thing he believed was that like a lot of leaders in the world, he believed that we, the United States, the CIA in particular, was omniscient. They knew everything. And so he believed that they already knew that he didn't have this stuff. So when they accused him of having it, he, it was just a pretense to get rid of him. And so he's like, why should I play their game? Like they already know all of this. And when Bush goes on national television and says, I've got these things, his spies already know that's not true. So this is just a game and I'm not going to play it. Okay, more follow-ups. And this one is definitely going to give you um, some more time to give a long answer, which you are totally entitled to do. This is your platform for this episode. What did then the CIA know? And when did it know it? Post-1991. Relative, relative to Saddam thinking it was omniscient. Uh, not very much. I mean, in the end, they, they knew, they learned a lot really... Um, over the first four or five years after 1991, defectors came out, okay? So people fled Saddam's uh, Iraq and scientists correctly figured that if they came out, found the CIA station at the embassy in Jordan or Turkey and said, hey, I'm really a scientist. I worked on this stuff um, and I can tell you what I know that they might be given you know, passage to the suburbs in America, and that's kind of the way it works, and it worked for them. So they did collect defect, accurate defector information for the first few years, and they were able to piece together a partial picture of the 
nuclear and biological programs. Those were the toughest ones to crack. Those were the ones that Saddam lied about the most. Um, and yet they never understood the big picture, which was what we've just discussed. They Nobody ever understood that he had actually destroyed all this stuff and then lied about it. Um, it didn't make any logical sense. You would have had to get inside his head and understand how he saw the threats to his own power, to his own life, and his own and his his pride, his dignity. I mean, we see this, you know, in other settings in the world today. Uh, dictators who preside over closed systems don't get a lot of honest advice from their aides. Nobody wants to tell the boss that he's maybe confusing people or doing the wrong thing. So he's left on his own to kind of figure out how the world works. And in Saddam's case, um, you know, he just kept uh, a conviction and you can listen to it in the tape, see it in the transcripts and in other documents over and over again. He was telling his comrades, hey, this is how the world works. Don't believe that. Um, don't believe what you hear in these capitals, Washington, London, you know, they know what's really going on. This is just a game for them and I'm not playing it. So to your point, there's a bit of, this isn't purely a rational worldview, but I'm trying to understand, I wrote this question down a few minutes ago. Why did he believe WMDs were so essential to his image and his power? Because if we go through the history here, 1980s, Israel takes out his initial nuclear um, program. They do that even though he had, he literally was using the WMDs on the battlefield. So that wasn't yeah. a deterrent. Um, he and Iran fight this quasi standstill horrific war. WDMDs don't deter that. And then obviously the United States um, wrecks his army in the Desert Storm, which at the time was one of the biggest, most powerful armies in the world, supposedly. Um, so for all of that, it doesn't seem as if the WMDs actually did anything to keep him in power determine the decisions his rivals or enemies were making. So why did he think they mattered so much? I get a nuclear weapon. Nuclear weapon clearly has that effect, but it doesn't seem like these missiles or these chemical weapons had a similar effect. Uh, that's a great question. Um, he, I would say there were three big reasons. Um, and I'll, I'll get to your last point because I think that's really the heart of the matter. Um, first, he did believe that chemical weapons, gas, were a winning weapon in the war against Iran. He felt that he he declared victory in that war. Of course, it was a terrible, bloody stalemate and a disaster, a million lives lost and no territory gained. The war ended where it began. But he, of course, declared victory. But in any event, it was a victory in the sense that Iran didn't defeat him. Iran had a, a larger population and a larger industrial base. Saddam started the war. He was an idiot to, do, to have done so. And this was immediately post-revolution in Iran. So there were all of these volunteers, um, in addition to professional soldiers who were willing to martyr themselves on the battlefield, running right at Iraqi tanks. And there were moments in the war when it looked like Iranian ground forces were going to break through Iraqi lines and go straight into Baghdad. And Ayatollah Khomeini had made it clear that if he took Baghdad, he was going to hang Saddam from the nearest lamppost. So gas was the way that he stopped those human wave attacks, as they were called. He, Because not even the volunteers were willing to run through mustard gas and sarin or able to do so. So he first, he thought it was a winning weapon. Second, he wanted strategic deterrence against Israel primarily. He knew that Israel possessed a nuclear weapon. As you mentioned, Israel had preemptively attacked his own nuclear um, capabilities of some French installed reactors uh, in 1981, June 1981. And that really angered him. And he felt that it was unjust as the self-imagined leader of the Arab world, that the Arab world's greatest nation, as he saw Iraq, didn't have the equivalent capability as Israel. Why had the world given Israel a the permission to build an undeclared nuclear weapons arsenal and suppressed Arab countries from doing so. And he would give speeches all the time saying, it's my intention to achieve parity with Israel. <laughs> you know, some of it's about the pride of the Arab world, but some of it is just about self-preservation because he really did believe nuclear war was a thing. 
and that the Israelis might just start it one day. So he wanted a retaliatory capacity. And then that leads to the last point, which was where you ended. Like, how how did this help him? If he didn't have a weapon, uh, why was WMD going to prevent somebody, deter somebody from attacking him? If you remember during the Gulf War, his biggest media achievement, it wasn't of strategic importance to the way the war was going to turn out, although it rattled um, Israel and the United States. He lobbed these Scud missiles into Israeli cities. Uh, it was the first time that Israel had been struck by long distance missiles in its existence. And they blew up in Haifa, Tel Aviv, elsewhere. And there were deaths and injuries, but they weren't, they were more nuisance weapons than, you know, actual war winning weapons. They, those warheads could have had chemical or biological weapons. And in the context of, you know, sort of Israeli history, Israeli doctrine, if they had gassed um, Israelis with missiles, then the pressure on Israeli leaders to retaliate in some escalating way would have been very heavy. And so he felt that while he was waiting to get a usable nuclear weapon, to have these long range missiles coupled with chemical or biological weapons might be enough if the Israelis knew he had them, might be enough to get them to back off. So that's why he pursued them. That's why he thought they were a source of his strength. So I'd love for you to help unpack something which I really um, have never failed to get a convincing answer on. So I've taken a variety of courses with uh, decision makers who played a huge role, obviously, um, in the choice to invade Iraq. And I think in many ways, when they tell the story and explain their motivations, they focus on, we really did believe there were WMDs, like this isn't Bush lied, people mm -hmm. died, like we really do believe it. And I'm thoroughly yeah. convinced of that. What I just have not been convinced of is why did this matter? I, I just I just don't, so let's, let's, let's assume he has chemical weapons. Let's assume the scuds are ready to go. He has the factories. We'd wrecked him in Desert Storm. We made the choice not to overthrow his regime. We'd already basically hinted at the tactical nuclear weapon use in terms of deterring his usage of these weapons on the battlefield. He has Iran to his east. Israel clearly is being held back on its by its own like volition there. Why did him possessing these weapons reach the level of this is truly a threat we need to handle? I just have never been convinced that even if it were true, this made any sense. And you have a perspective, obviously, but I'm just curious to get us inside of like the you know decision maker perspective here. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's another great question because I don't think it makes um, clear sense. Um, you can hear different arguments from insiders about that question. Um, one is that, uh, I think Paul Wolfowitz said this, he was then, of course, the Deputy Secretary of Defense and uh, a real hawk uh, on the invasion question after 9-11, one of the first right after 9-11 to say, oh, we got to go, Saddam did this. Um, and he... Um, was quoted later as saying, well, it wasn't really about WMD. It's just that was the one issue that we could sell everybody on, like in our coalition, in our cabinet, with our allies. The Brits were sold on WMD. Maybe they wouldn't have been sold on just getting rid of Saddam for the heck because he had survived for so long and seemed to, th to be a threat. So that's a possibility that it was primarily a strategic communications choice that yes, they definitely believe that he had the WMDs. Yes, it would be better if he didn't have them, but that it wasn't the honest preemptive war that it was advertised to be. So that's one take on it. On the other hand, if you look at Tony Blair's role in this, and you know the, the Brits did this huge 9-11 style investigation it's like, I forget how many pages, like 10, more than 10,000 pages of records and testimony and an amazing new archive of memos, contemporary memos and so forth. Blair, for his part, he really did believe that the 21st century was going to be defined by the marriage of dictators and WMD. And that, you know, this was something that the world had to recognize as the new um, threat in, in the post-Cold War world, and that he saw um, 
Saddam as a kind of demonstration project of this ideology that he possessed and that went back into the 90s. You know, Clinton kind of said things like that from time to time. I'm not sure that at all that he would have waged preemptive war against Saddam. I, I don't know. Al Gore was more of a hawk than Clinton. If he had been elected president, he might have been um, at least involved in discussions about Iraq after 9-11. But in any event, um, Blair really believed that it was a danger and that preemption was necessary because you never knew what Saddam was going to do. Um, but I, I basically, look, Colin Powell was in your corner uh, in asking the question is like, why, 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 why doesn't deterrence work? I mean, the, there were, Colin Powell was the most credible figure in the Bush cabinet who argued for strategic patience, who said, look, the, the system that has been in place in the 1990s is working. Um, the you know Saddam is is boxed up. Um, he is hasn't been able to rebuild a conventional army. He can't invade his neighbors the way he did before. Um, he's aging, um, and even if he has been hiding WMD despite eleven years of inspections and nobody finding it, even if it's it's okay, I I think it's probably there, but it's deeply hidden, obviously, because we've looked at every box. Uh, mm -hmm. So so maybe uh, we should just trust in deterrence. He knows that we'll come after him hard if he does something. But, you know, this was ultimately George W. Bush's decision. This was one of those instances where, you know, the president decides he can get all kinds of advice from experienced um, cabinet officials. And there were certainly plenty of hawks around him to endorse his decision. But he, the record is clear that when aides came to him right after 9-11 and said, Saddam's probably behind this, or you got to start thinking about Iraq, that he was, his reaction was mm, not right now, but yeah, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. And he came back to it as soon as the Taliban fell in Afghanistan and sort of early December of 2001, he came right back to it and said, okay, I, you know, some of you wanted to move a little faster than I did, but I, I told you I was going to be here and now I'm here. Let's start talking about it. So he had a conviction that he never really articulated uh, as to what its basis was. Was it WMD? Mm. No, I think it was just this shall not stand. This is a time we got to get rid of this guy. He's a threat. And that's kind of when you listen to his words, that's more where he is. He's not making a technical argument about WMD. Yeah. And I like the way you answered that because I, I won't say who this was from the Bush administration, but I was in a seminar um, and this person was focused on, well, the desert fox airstrikes policy wasn't sustainable. It wasn't right. working. And my instant reaction at the time was, wait a second, we spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on the actual war in Iraq. And then that's right. not including the aftermath of the Middle East collapsing around it. So right. obviously, if we compare the cost of flight time for F-15s <laughs> doing airstrikes versus the actual right. war, what does sustainability right. even mean? Right. So what you answered the question broadly, which is, Maybe, I want to say, I don't like using the word lie here, but the word honesty is more accurate. We didn't invade Iraq because we couldn't maintain F-15 strikes. There was right. just this broader worldview change. And I think the other yeah. I think the other side of it too, I'm curious, you've obviously written about um, this period in, with, with, with ghost wars um, in Afghanistan and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. But I think a lot of the logic post 9-11 is also that, look, if we talked about bin Laden in 1996 and said, hey, look at this threat. Someone would also say, well, he's in a box. He's, you right. know, he's in Sudan. He's in the, he's in right. the mountains. Who really cares? Right. They're saying right. we have to prevent that. So I guess the question for you is knowing that history, what is the validity to the argument of it's easy to say in retrospect that it wouldn't have mattered, but if we'd also pursued costly strikes against bin Laden in Afghanistan in the 1990s, folks would probably say, well, that probably wasn't worth it. That wasn't warranted. Not <laughs> yeah. understanding the world that we could have lived in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, good, chewy question. I think I'm a little bit skeptical of counterfactuals because there's so many ways that the butterfly effect could change, you know, the way things evolve. But if you ask what would be an alternative history if deterrence had been maintained, one of the things that I worked on in this book was, okay, well, where was Saddam at? Where was his head at after 9-11? Mm -hmm. What was he thinking about? And I was uh, stunned to discover that he had, in his 60s, um, 
discarded a lot of his obsession with military affairs and had started writing novels. He was writing novels um, at a furious pace, handwriting uh, his novels in Arabic and passing them to his his uh, kind of press office where those people were responsible for copy editing and getting them ready for publication. And the point is, one answer to your question has often been, well, he would have eventually reconstituted these weapon systems and threatened his neighbors because that's just who he is. And you can't rule out that possibility because he had invaded two neighbors unprovoked before. Okay. So he was, um, but he was not the same man um, in 2001, 2002, as he had been in those earlier periods. He was, first of all, in his 60s. And second of all, he had, um, not the military capability that he had possessed when he invaded Iran and Kuwait. And he had become sort of, you know, obsessed with his own legacy, which he interpreted primarily through literature. That was how he was going to leave his last mark as the president of Iraq. I guess, um, I guess this will be the only time I've ever kind of spoken up for Saddam Hussein. Given everything you've just said, in terms of motivations, the shift in the American viewpoint after 9-11, it seems as if even if Saddam had come completely clean about his post-1990s actions, would the invasion still have happened? I know it's hard to, once again, you, you, you're wary of counterfactuals and that's valid, but I just, from his perspective, I'm kind of hearing, if he's telling all his guys, this doesn't really matter, it sounds as if the 9-11 change in the American mindset was we preempt threats. We don't wait for the smoking gun, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even if he destroyed his capabilities, he could just rebuild them over again. They're obviously off the shelf. Like, what do you think about that? Well, so one way to answer it would be to say, if the government of the United States had become persuaded or had no choice but to accept on the basis of evidence that Saddam really had destroyed all of his WMD, then um, I don't think it would have been politically possible to invade. If you go back and look at the record leading up to the invasion, you know, in memory, it was like a steamroller and we just rolled right in. In fact, the Bush uh, White House was very worried that they hadn't brought the public along adequately, despite all of their, we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud sort of rhetoric and that there was a great deal of skepticism about the war. And the main reason why the public was as accepting as it was had to do with this warning that if we don't do this, another 9-11, only worse, could, could follow. And so if it had been demonstrated that there was no such scenario because he didn't have anything, I think um, it would have been, first of all, Britain couldn't have gotten involved to the extent that that mattered. So there would have been a coalition of one at that point instead of like three. Um, and um, I don't know that that the Bush administration would have felt that it was able to go forward, even if the president, you know, in his gut would have wished to do so. Um, so I think um, that's 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 the most likely way to to think about it um, um yeah i'll just stop there i think uh what i'm really curious about then is what did this research and writing teach you about the cia the cia is in this kind of weird space Just to the question around um the effects of the iraq war i think the the cia is um politically hot um in a way it hasn't been since the 1970s um you obviously have the Iraq war, you have the bad calls around the withdrawal from Kabul, but then you have, um, I think the really admirable work that was admirable work that was done in the lead up to the war in Ukraine. What does this taught you about the CIA and your perspective on it as a functioning entity? Well, so there's sort of, in, in those days anyway, there were clearly two halves of the CIA as a professional kind of spying organization. There was the operation side, which was involved in trying to steal secrets from foreign countries and then carry out covert action when ordered by the president to do so. And those those were um, that was the part of the agency that after the Kuwait war was basically ordered by successive presidents, first H.W. Bush, then Clinton, then W, although with less conviction because of that 
point he wasn't persuaded that it could work, they were basically ordered to try to foment a coup in Baghdad, get rid of Saddam. This would be the way they would solve the problem, the old fashioned way, 50s, you know, kind of Cold War era coup attempt. Um, so that um, effort uh, failed repeatedly, and it was one of the least successful covert action um, records that the CIA has has uh, had since you know the fifties. Now you can argue, uh, CIA officers will tell you, you know, why the, they were poorly served by their presidents and they didn't get the authorities they needed, and but by the end of the nineties, even the most gung-ho covert action types at the CIA were advising first Clinton and then Bush, we can't do it. <laughs> Don't ask mm. us to do it. Like it's not possible. So we're, we've, we've banged our shovel on that cement enough. So please stop asking us uh, to do it. And nonetheless, every six or nine months, they'd be summoned to the Oval Office and the president would say, can you foment a coup? And they'd say, no, we really can't. Don't. So that's that side. Then there's the analytical side. The analytical side is more complicated because it's not just the CIA. The CIA at that time, pr prior to the uh, development of reforms that now has created the Director of National Intelligence, which is meant to bring all the different parts of the government together that collects intelligence and analyze it together. At that point, the CIA was kind of the lead in putting together written products for decision makers that were classified that said, this is the best information we have, but they used, they had to collaborate with all the other intelligence agencies. So the defense intelligence agency, which is massive for the national mm -hmm. security agency, which is the eavesdropping agency. And in the case of WMD, like all kinds of people weighed in the department of energy, because they have our nuclear weapons labs and so on. And so they, um, I think when you look back at the, very bad, flawed analysis that they produced. Um, they would agree that at critical moments, they were just sloppy. They just moved really fast because the president wanted a document that kind of summed up everything we know. And so instead of like going out and really reinvestigating and say, hey, you know, we need a year to go back and let's tr let's start over again. Let's challenge ourselves. Let's let's question our own assumptions. Instead of doing that, they just kind of copied and pasted old you know, last year's report on chemical weapons and last year's report on biological weapons. And they pushed it all together and they and then they wrote through it and they gave these key judgments, but there wasn't any new fact finding. Now, you know, I have talked to CIA analysts involved in this effort and they say, you know what would have happened if you had put your hand up and said, what if he doesn't have anything at all? Won't that be really embarrassing? Yeah. They said, you know, it, there's so much groupthink there was so much political momentum that I think it's a problem in our intelligence agencies that even independent civil servants, well-intentioned, well-trained, who are told again and again, you're supposed to call them like you see them, you know, balls and strikes. Institutional life doesn't give a lot of space for bucking conventional wisdom when war pieces on the line when the country has been traumatized by something like the 9-11 attacks. And you're just mm -hmm. saying, and you're going to be the one who says, uh, what if what if he doesn't have anything at all? And it's sort of astonishing that nobody said that. <laughs> like there wasn't one person who said, there's no story of a whistleblower. We would have seen the Hollywood movie by now if somebody yes. had said, I, you know, I've got a conviction. And I think what that tells you is just how bureaucracies work when they're under pressure and when the politics are really hot. And I'm afraid it means that, um, you know, either we have a lot of work to do to strengthen our in institutions so that individuals can really think freely and speak freely under pressure. And, and even, you know, it doesn't mean they're going to be right, but that people are going to stop and listen and search for evidence on the basis of what they say. Um, you know, last thing I would say, um, in you in the case of Ukraine, which you correctly identify as a big kind of analytical success, you know, it wasn't just that they put out the intelligence they collected. They were pretty transparent about what they had. Like, mm -hmm. they didn't say, well, we're listening to this guy's phone. But I mean, basically, you understood that they had a lot of photographs and they had a lot of conversations and they more or less said as much. And they had no doubt about what was unfolding and 
And they also made it transparent to the whole world. So they were willing to have their homework checked. And if they were wrong, they would have been held accountable for it. Um, you know, in the case of the Iraq war, the intelligence was seen as an instrument of political speech making rather than a kind of exercise in transparency, taking the American people or the global public into their confidence and saying this is, you know, Colin Powell tried to do that in that speech at the UN, but it turned out that that was just another um, overheated, um, selective interpretation of the evidence they possessed. You know, sometimes it's a little hokey to ask a author of a work of history for, you know, lessons for future leaders. But I think in this case, this is a particularly momentous time for this book to come out because if we're looking at U.S. foreign policy moving forward, we've clearly oriented around our, oriented ourselves around how will authoritarian leaders, Vladimir Putin in Russia and Xi Jinping in China, how do they see the world? What are their objectives? What is the threat posed by their desire to, you know, synchronize that worldview with their actual objectives? And then what does the United States do about it? So in many ways, it feels as if we're in a similar period to the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so I guess the question for you would be, um, what are just the like analytical, and like you kind of said, you just laid out a great one. There has to be someone in the room raising, like almost at an institutional level, you hope, someone raising their hand saying, what if blank? Um, and mm -hmm. not being not only not being punished for it, but that should be a, that should be something that the leader is actively encouraging um, totally. within their system. But what are some lessons for confronting these future opaque situations? Well, I think one of them is, uh, and I, I thought about this as I was writing because I had the requirement to empathize with Saddam as a human being without sanitizing him. That was the way I defined my own mission. So I really wanted to get inside his head. I really wanted to suspend judgment, even though he had killed hundreds of thousands of people, including hundreds of thousands of his own citizens and imprisoned and tortured all kinds of people. Nonetheless, I wanted to try to get inside his head and see the world through his eyes. And, um, the tapes really helped and the other materials helped. So I had something to really work with. I didn't have to speculate. I could, I could work from evidence. But as I was trying that to empathize without sanitizing in order to gain insights into a mystery about why he had behaved the way he had behaved, I did think from time to time, okay, I'm a writer. I'm allowed to do this. You know, if I do it the wrong way, maybe people will say I was too soft on them or, or maybe people will say I didn't listen enough. But clearly, I, I have permission to try this <laughs> mm -hmm. as a writer. Um, but what if you were a president? I think it's very difficult in our competitive political, democratic political system to, um, to empathize with, to speak to enemies. Um, the system isn't really set up to reward the risk-taking. There's a you know, one of the resources that I had for the book were the tapes of uh, Bill Clinton's conversations with different world leaders about Saddam and Iraq. And there's one where he's talking to Tony Blair in 1997 or so. And he says, you know, have you guys ever talked to Saddam since like 1990? Has anybody in your government ever talked to him? And Blair said, mm, I'm not really sure. I'd have to check. I don't think so. And Clinton said, if, you know, I would, if I could, I would pick up the phone and call the son of a bitch. But I can't do that in the American system. I would just be roasted if I tried to do that. But I really want to know what he's thinking. <laughs> and, and to be, you know, and I think to be fair to the American political system, this was in, in that by by that point, not only had Saddam obviously fought a war with the United States, but he'd attempted clumsily to you know assassinate George H. W. Bush. Um, so there 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 were complicated yeah, dynamics. Yes, there. yeah, or he was perceived to have done so. I'm not. The book goes into whether or not we whether that case is as reliable as it seemed at the time. But I I don't know. But I, there's a lot of um, dogs that didn't bark and that it could have been a Kuwaiti intelligence operation to discredit Saddam in the end. Uh, but that's another Okay, so podcast. I'll ask you this question then. What do you, what do you, yeah, hold there, what do you, okay, so then that, so here's the fascinating counterexample then. You know, Donald Trump obviously talks to Kim Jong-un a lot. Right. Um, he's kind of like the counter example right. Right. of just picking up the phone in ways that not just like the system in a conspiracy sense matter, but like everyone in the room is saying, you should not do that. Right. Like, what's your take on that? 
approach. Right. Well, okay. So I don't think that president should be picking up the phone and calling, you know, dictators. Clinton was right not to call Saddam. But I think um, the absence of any contact over a long period of time is irrational um, if you have a lot at stake in the relationship. So what you want is a lot of contact. And you may not have it at the leader level, but you want to keep the channels open. You want to keep talking. If we had had a lot of contact, we might have picked up that Saddam's interests had shifted, that he was obsessed with novel writing, that he was distracted, that he wasn't, you know, or we might have picked up some of what the records now show us, which is that he was issuing orders to his scientists. Are you sure you have destroyed everything? Because I'm worried based on what the CIA is saying that maybe you have overlooked something. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. get rid of it all. Like maybe things that would have jarred the collective um, assumptions mm -hmm. about him might have surfaced in those contacts. But if you don't have contact, you're never going to pick up those. There's that, that's the only way you're ever going to acquire those kinds of insights. And, you know, I think... Um, Another reason why that conversation generally doesn't happen is because our tool, again, another podcast, um, short of war is economic sanctions. Sanctions are only effective if you build a coalition of people who agree that sanctions must be enforced to the letter. Otherwise, there's really no point in having them. And if you start talking to the target of sanctions, you undermine the case for sanctions. That's often mm -hmm. the reason why presidents are advised, don't pick up that phone, because then the Burmese, if you call uh, Kim Jong-un, then the, the Burmese the next day are going to say, well, I mean, if Trump's talking to him, I can sell him you know, some trucks um, and, mm -hmm. and he can't yell at me about that. So there are all these kind of structural reasons why it's very difficult to sustain contact with an adversary. But I think um, and there are moral and other reasons to be hesitant about doing it. But all I'm saying is that we failed to grasp um, things that were graspable about Saddam's intentions. And ultimately, it's the duty of statesmen to read adversaries' capabilities and intentions to the best of their ability. So why give up on the effort to try to decipher somebody's intentions. I mean, in Saddam's case, he was erratic enough that I personally wouldn't have wanted to set national security policy on the basis of guessing at his intentions. I would have been much more interested in deterring his capabilities. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we didn't have any contact with him for 10 years was an error in my judgment. So I think the last uh, lesson question would be, there's a huge gulf I feel between the type of literally thuggish killer leader that a man like Saddam is, like that a man like Vladimir Putin is, and the type of person who has become a leader in the U.S. political system and Western democracies in, in general. How does one best interact there? Because I think if it was a, and the big, the bigger that gap, the bigger the lack of understanding, the bigger the threat there's going to be posed in the first place at a perception and actual level. What What's the takeaway from really interrogating Saddam's perspective here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a great observation because, uh, and you can see it in the biographies of both Saddam and say Putin. I mean, Saddam much more extreme. He came of age as a political assassin, a gunman who stood on the corner and opened fire at leaders of his own country who had probably committed some local murders even before that. Um, and he had participated in secret conspiracies to carry out coup attempts more than once, ended up in jail once, and eventually rode into the palace on a tank and became part of the leadership of Iraq and ultimately the president and held on to that dictatorship. So he was a creature of violence and conspiracies. He'd grown up in a really hard place in kind of semi-rural Iraq, uh, and he never lost the life lessons of his upbringing, both political and, um, you know, sort of social. So there's a limit to how you're going to interact with such a person. But the insight that I came away with to address your question directly was less about what happens when you talk to Saddam, because if you talk to Saddam, he's mostly going to talk at you. He's going to give you a monologue. If you, you should listen to it because it contains a lot of clues as to what he's thinking and doing. But the, he also presides over a system, the system of security men, of 
ministers of state institutions, a lot of what he cares about is his own preservation. But that system is penetrable. And it does, you can interrogate that system. Like you can, you can figure out what's really going on. And you'll find dissenters and people, even in a uh totalitarian state that makes it very risky to speak out against the leader, there are ways to start to learn about what's really going on. And that's why I think, you know, it's just common sense that if possible, you want to have as much contact with the system that you're worried is going to threaten your well-being. And it's, so it's not just about Saddam light bulb moment in a conversation with Saddam. It's also about the whole thing that he has built, the apparatus that he presides over, and that is also part of what you're worried about. So closing question, um, past 20 years, not only from your writing perspective, but also the American political system, we've really seen so much revolve around the Middle East. I think it would have been easy six months ago to do this episode and basically say, hey, you know, we're pivoting <laughs> to the Indo-Pacific. Like, let's talk right, about, right, you right. know, this, 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 or that. Do you think the next 20 years um, of your life and career are going to continue to just be defined by the Middle East? Or am I actually, actually, no, not, don't, don't make a prediction. That's not helpful. Better question would be, are we just going to be continually circling back? Are we going to move on? Or is just, or do we just need to analytically accept that for a variety of complicated reasons, right. we are going to be able to truly pivot as three administrations in a row have now attempted to do. Right, that. right. Well, I mean, it's the sort of question of our time in foreign policy. And um, I think if you look back at the post-war period, um, all the way back to the 50s, the t reasons that we have been uh, engaged in the Middle East basically have come down to Israel and oil. Uh, for an awfully long time. Oil, because we felt that the free flow of oil to um, the West was essential to our economies, and Israel, because it was a bedrock alliance, a security alliance, and um, they lived in a rough neighborhood, and we partnered with them even when we were also estranged at the same time. Now, if you ask, what's changed? Um, about those two fundamental reasons why we keep going back and keep getting bogged down. Well, Israel is still um, a bedrock ally and still lives in a rough neighborhood and still gets into dust ups uh, with its neighbors and the conflict, um, uh, not only with neighboring states, but the unresolved status of Palestinians hasn't changed. Um, and despite many, many efforts by American presidents. So that work is undone. And that alliance is still there. Now, a future president could decide to change uh, the way America defines its friends and allies in the Middle East, but I have trouble believing that American politics would ever yield such a change in my lifetime. Then you could ask about oil. So that's one that maybe eight months ago or a year ago, you might have said, oh, we don't need it as much. I mean, we're moving past uh, fossil fuels. And we're energy anyway, independent now, like separate we're, from yeah, we're, the yeah, past. Yeah, we don't need them. And I think that is broadly true, and I do think in 20 years it will be less significant that we keep the Straits of Hormuz open. Um, mm -hmm. We can also ask the Chinese to participate in that at some point if they think it's important to their economy. But I think the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine is a reminder that our allies and our own economy remains um, uncomfortably dependent on the flows of fossil fuel energy, in this case, um, you know, Europe survived the attempt by Russia to starve them of natural gas and energy and have a really cold winter hoping to break up the alliance that was supporting Ukraine. And how did Germany and other countries get out of that dilemma? They went to Qatar, where I'm sitting right now, and they mm -hmm. made gas deals. And that is LNG that has to go on ships and has to go down the same place, same passages that oil used to go down. So maybe it's not so much oil that's critical, but LNG coming out of the Gulf is going to be critical for at least the next three to five years, you know, and so, and you see the, the, disruptions to world trade that doesn't have to do with fossil fuels that has arisen uh, from the Houthi attacks, um, you know, at the uh, passages through to the Suez Canal. So 
It is still a critical area of the world economy. I do think that it will become less important over the next 20 years, but it wasn't just October 7th that reminded us that we want to be done with the Middle East, and but the Middle East isn't done with us. It's also the energy economy that's still um, interdependent in ways that our government and our allies continually feel a need to get involved in the region in order to support that energy economy. Well said. Steve Cole, thank you for joining me on The Realignment. The book is The Achilles Trap. Thank you for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed talking to you. 